Good morning, and welcome to the Wilson Center. My name is Robert Daly. I direct the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States, and we are extremely pleased this morning uh, to be able to co-sponsor this event with the Asia Program, led by Bob Hathaway, who is down here on the left, and to have with us uh, Evan Osnos, uh, who is, as I'm sure all of you know, with The New Yorker now, uh, and is the author of Age of Ambition, um, a terrific book which I finished about three weeks ago and have found myself dipping into since uh, and have been in touch with a number of Beijing journalist friends just over the past several days and most of them seem to be reading it as well. Uh, so I hope that you will have a chance uh, to get a copy out front of the door if you don't have one already and to try to you know, get a better look at what's going on in China today. Uh, Evan was in China from 2005 to 2013 initially with the Chicago Tribune as their bureau chief, and then as the staff writer for The New Yorker. He is still currently a staff writer with The New Yorker, but he's now here in Washington, D.C., so we hope that we'll be seeing him at Fora on China around town for some time to come. He's covering national and foreign affairs now. For the Trib previously, uh, he'd also been based in New York and had also been in Iraq. So he's got broad international experience. He is the winner of the Asia Society's Osborne Elliott Prize for Excellence in Journalism on Asia, and the Livingston Award for Young Journalists, and a few other awards with, I believe, uh, more to come. You may also know his as the mug at the bottom of the New Yorker webpage that you click on uh, for artists and writers. That's how you're <laughs> known in, in, in my family. We watched a very good dialogue about a year and a half ago at the Asia Society. We mm. were with Ambassador Roy and Susan yeah. Shirk. And my wife and I were up uh, late watching it, and, and it was a, really a very good dialogue. And I kept saying, well, these are interesting points. These are interesting points. And my wife kept saying, what, Zhen Shui, Zhen Shui. He's, he's really, really very handsome. I said, well, this is really not about that. Um, but, maybe she but, was talking about State, actually. I think uh, She knew State previously, and she had a <coughs> high opinion, but that wasn't quite her response. Um, and I'm really sort of sorry that you left Beijing, that you left China. I'd greatly been enjoying uh, your reporting, especially the past few years since I left China. And when you're not there, you very, very quickly lose your sense of what's really going on. And it's tough just from looking at the, the news media from the news reports to, to regain that. You, you, is this true? Is this not true? You just, you just lose your feel for it. And I thought that your writing really came closest to recovering that for me. Mm. I mean, there's a blend, if you saw the reports and the, and the blog posts uh, that Evan did from Beijing, of the personal and the political and, and everything in between, a sort of a seamless blending of those, which for me replicated the experience of, of, of living in China, where the personal is political mm. and vice versa. And I thought that you captured that beautifully as a very empathetic observer, but who was never the subject of the reports. And that was something else I think is very difficult to do in, in writing about China, is to not be writing about your own journey of discovery, but to be writing about China in itself. And I think that those virtues that were in the reporting are also in Age of Ambition, which is, I say, on sale outside as well. And so what we'd like to do this morning uh, is have a fairly informal conversation. And I've got some questions to kick off, but then I uh, will throw it out to you as well. And I wanted to start by asking, because you're back now about a year, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, by asking what you miss most about living in China, what, because it's, it's a, for most of us, it's a life-transforming experience, spending a long period of time there. And coming back here now, what do you find yourself pining for? To be perfectly honest, we miss it enormously, my wife and I both, I think. Um, it was almost exactly a year ago that we came back, and the thing that we miss, the thing that we describe in our house when we're talking about what we miss, is what we've described as the cucumber principle. That's what we call it to each other, which is the sense that when you go down the street in Beijing to go buy a cucumber or a bag of fruit, you never know what's going to happen to you. You truly never know what's going to happen to you. And it can change your sense of the place. And for all of Washington's abundant virtues, I have to say that the experience of acquiring a cucumber is a fairly predictable exercise. <laughs> And I'm going to give you actually a specific example of what I mean. I mean, I was literally in, um, shortly before we moved back, um, I was in Beijing and was on my way down the street to go to the bank, I think. And a guy, uh, I came upon a man lying on the street having a seizure. And he was um, lying on the sidewalk. And people didn't really know what to do 
in that situation because of a couple of reasons. You know, people who have been in China in the last few years may have encountered this phenomenon, which is that, and this goes all the way back to Lu Xun, he wrote about it as well, but people are always, they're hesitant about getting involved in a situation that is not of their making. And so they might say, well, if I help this guy on the ground, am I going to get blamed for it? And there was a famous case in China called the Peng Yu case, in which a guy did help and uh, he helped uh, somebody who had fallen getting on a bus. And then he was blamed for it, and he was taken to court, and he was ordered to pay a, a penalty. You reference this in the book, right? I, I reference it, yeah. And I ended up following a specific case in the book. But this happened right outside our front door, and it was really an interesting kind of um, moment to reflect on the nature of public morality in China. And I ended up, I mean, I stopped and ended up getting to know this guy a bit and ended up taking him... Um, to the, uh, to the train station a few days later, and, and he ended up going back down to Guangdong, where he was from, and he'd had seizures for years and years. And I said to him, how often do people stop and how often do they not stop? And he said, to be perfectly honest, I wouldn't stop either because you don't know what's going to happen. And, and who's going to help you if you get hurt and if, if you get in trouble? So I sort of, anyway, that was an extended example of the, uh, of the cucumber principle. Some of it's just adventure, right? I mean, it's more discovery than you might find just walking down the street in the United States. I think part of it is adventure and part of it is that so much of these kinds of deeper questions about what it means to be Chinese and what it means to live in China right now are being hashed out in real time. I mean, that issue about what is my responsibility as a citizen to a, to a stranger, that sort of what is the Good Samaritan concept in China in 2014, these things are playing out in plain view, and um, people talk about them. And I mean, the case that I write about in the book is the case of a little girl down in, in Foshan who was hit by a van. People might remember that. Her name was Xiao Yuyu, a little Yuyu. And um, these kinds of, you know, there were moments in American life where we were doing that too. I mean, the Kitty Genovese case in the 1960s in New York where a woman was killed and people did or did not intervene. This was sort of the question. And, um, all of those sorts of issues are, are playing out, uh, I think, in real time. And that's kind of fascinating. And um, it's obviously a source of, you know, I feel like we're writing the story of what it means to be Chinese right now. Well, let's, I'm going to talk based on that about, a little bit about the title of the book. It's, it's The Age of Ambition, Chasing Fortune, Truth, and Faith in the New China. And as I was reading this, I kept, I kept questioning this, you know, is it, is it the age of ambition? I mean, mm -hmm. It sounds like, is it the age of anxiety, the age of anger? You mm -hmm. reference the Gilded Age as, a, as in part inspiring this title, but one obviously thinks also of something like the age of innocence, and I guess it's mm -hmm. not the age of innocence profoundly, although you don't mention that. I know when I first got to China, it was pre-Tiananmen, it was very much the age of ideals, mm -hmm. not yet ambition really, just intellectual personal excitement. So could you talk about why, why you chose this title? Why did you settle on ambition as capturing the, 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 the mood or people's, people's desires in China now in the period that you were there? Well, I was interested in a whole range of different experiences in China, people living very different lives. And so some of them led what would be described as successful you know, they had successful lives within the new Chinese model. So they made money, or they got the academic appointment that they wanted, or they were able to start the news organization that they wanted. And then other people, of course, ran into obstacles along the way of one kind or another. Um, you know, in some cases, it was a political obstacle. But in other cases, it was simply that there, it's a very competitive place and a very competitive time. And there's a limited number of people who are going to get those opportunities. And if you don't have the sort of connections and so on, then it's much harder to do. So the thing that was driving them, it seemed, was not the res the thing that, that linked these different experiences the longer I lived there was not the result, but it was the motivation. It was the impulse. Mm -hmm. It was the thing that was driving them. There's a concept in sociology called the capacity to aspire, and that is a powerful idea that once people acquire the ability to even imagine a different state of being, that it changes who they are. Because... Um, you know, in Wang Qishan, who talks about Tocqueville these days and is encouraging people to read the Tocqueville. And House of Cards. Which he and House of Washington. Cards. <laughs> By the way, Chinese friends keep saying, is that what Washington's like? And I'm saying, no, you need to see Veep. Yes. <laughs> so, um, but the thing about, so the idea of aspiration was just a really powerful impulse. And then you'd see it across all of these different 
kinds of, of experiences. And then if you looked back historically, what you discovered was that the idea of ambition, you know, well, there's a lot of ways to translate it, but uh, as you know, I mean, one of the ways is, is ye xin, which is wild heart. And the idea of having a wild heart, having a, you know, being, being somebody who was said to be wild hearted, to be ye xin, used to be a, a pejorative. I mean, it really was a very critical thing to be described as ambitious. And it could ruin your life. I mean, during the Cultural Revolution, if you were a wild-hearted person, that was a calamity for your family. And then you've seen that sort of change. And I started paying attention to the way people use the term. And um, one of the guys who's the found, one of the founders of New Oriental, uh, which is one of the big English programs, he uses it as a centerpiece now in his sort of motivational speeches. And I went in, if you go into Chinese bookstores, you'll find books that are called things like how to have a wild heart in your 20s. And um, so that concept became just incredibly, I, it's a little bit of the spotlight effect too, that once you identify something as a significant ingredient, I started to see it everywhere. But I also was, t I was interested by the idea that when I would say to people, people would say, well, what are you writing about? And I'd say, I'm writing about ambition. Everybody had an, amb had an opinion and it wasn't altogether positive. People would say, oh, ambition is not, we don't have ambition in China, that's not Chinese. Um, or that's something that is, that is a Western creation. It's a Western framework. And I've been very interested to see how this book title has been translated into Chinese. What, what, what are they doing with it? Actually, they're calling it Ye Xin Shi Dai, which is the age of ambition, that, in effect. So you didn't want a mainland. You wrote about not having a mainland translation in The New Yorker. Is this, is this Taiwan? Is this Hong Kong? Who's, who's doing well, it? Well, actually, this is Chinese. In some cases, Chinese media have written about the book, mm. and they've used this um, this translation. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, I wanted to have a mainland Chinese edition, right. and uh, some Chinese publishers had asked about a mainland Chinese edition, and then they reviewed the manuscript and decided, well, um, we, we would ask you to do a special edition, was the word that they described. And, um, <laughs> That involved, you know, changing about a quarter of the contents, and so I said, "Well, let's 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 hold off on a special edition, and we'll go ahead with a Taiwan edition." And so that's what we're going to do, and uh, it'll be available to people in China. Now, I've, you know, watching China, it's it's changing so fast and on such a vast scale, and it's such a, it's such a complex place. I've I've been struck for years that there's sort of a Heisenberg uncertainty principle. There's the spin and statistics problem, you know, which in, in physics says the more closely you, you pinpoint the location of a particle, the less you're able to say about where it's headed and vice versa. And with China, it seems to me it's, it's the same thing. The more you describe a changing China, the less you are able to capture what China is right now. And when you focus on a portrait, it can be easy to miss yeah. the directions. And so I wanted to ask you sort of against that background, is it still the age of ambition as you saw it, or is it something else? Is it an age of, say, Xi Jinping, for example? Mm -hmm. you, you describe, I think, in the uh, foreword to the book, that the, you say the story of China is the story of the collision between aspiration and authoritarianism. And it seems to me that Xi Jinping's dream is precisely an attempt to say that these are one and the same, mm -hmm. or they can be, that, that, that authoritarianism is the essential enabler of aspiration, mm -hmm. and that aspirations need to be uh, uh, directed toward national power. Mm -hmm. um, so if, how long do you think it re we remain in one age? Has it already shifted when you look, when you look at China today? It's a great question. I have to tell you, the, the, uh, when this book initially came out um, about a month ago, Amazon had it listed in the Chinese history section. And I looked at that and I said, what, how, how, I just, it came out two days ago, how can it be history? And then I realized actually that was a more honest description than I even had recognized because the moment you write a book in, about China, contemporary China, it is immediately history. Um, and I think you're absolutely right in the sense that, I would say, I would say two things. One, I, I think this is, emphatically the age of ambition mm -hmm. in the sense that this is a period in which let's remember ambition does not describe a state of satisfaction in right. fact it describes a state of unsatisfaction or something before satisfaction and this is this period in which people have been told going back to 1979 mm -hmm. that it is up to them to as the there was a newspaper headline that i set aside at one point that the newspaper headline said it is up to you to blaze your own path and fight it was in like the hebei daily mm. and um 
you know, compare that to the previous message. In the heyday of socialism, after all, you'd been told that you were supposed to be a rustless screw in the revolutionary machine. This was your highest calling. That's what Lei Feng told you to be. And now you are being told you have to look out for yourself, you have to define your own sense of success, and then you have to achieve it. What Xi Jinping has recognized, I think correctly, was that the old language that they were using to communicate with the public yeah. was defunct. You know, the truth was it was, not, um, it was not rallying anybody to the cause to say to people, let's pull together around a scientific outlook on development, um, or the three represents. What he recognized was, I need to, in a sense, respect the public enough to say to them, I'm going to speak to you in a vernacular that makes, that makes sense. And the Chinese dream, which is the idea that he introduced in the end of 2012, beginning of 2013, is a recognition of that. But I think there's a key distinction, which is that he, what he is trying to do is to provide an answer to the, the question of what is the Chinese dream. What he's saying is, it is the responsibility and the opportunity to rally together around a shared idea of China's great renewal. And within that, you will actualize your own sense of self, uh, of your own sense of aspiration. That, that last part is the part that I'm, not, that, that I'm not convinced by. Because when I go around Beijing, I was there about six weeks ago in Shanghai, <coughs> and you talk to people about what is the Chinese dream, what they'll actually say is they have a much more personalized sense of what their own aspirations are. And it, you know, some of the people I write about in this book, some of the people I spent a lot of time with over the last few years, are people who are young nationalists for whom the great renewal of the nation is actually part of their dream. But there are an awful lot of people who have much more immediate concerns. They want to start that business, or they want to puncture that barrier that prevents them from getting into the middle class. And you know, w the point at which age of ambition becomes the age of anxiety, right. or the age of frustration, or the age of disappointment, you know, that's the political, um, that's the key moment that we should be worried about from the Chinese stability perspective, if we're trying to uh, sort of recognize what the risks are. Um, I'm not sure we're there yet. I, this is one of the reasons why I think it's just, it's too early to be able to say whether Xi Jinping, what he has set out for himself is plausible or not. But it is, um, it is enormously ambitious what he has set out to do, which is to try to reinvigorate the uh, collective enterprise that Deng Xiaoping laid out for people uh, a generation ago. In sitting here in Washington, because we, we as we look at China, and certainly as we do here at the Kissinger Institute, where the focus is on bilateral relations. Do you see a relationship between these personal ambitions and national ambition? Because national ambition uh, seems to be growing. Uh, when we look at, the, at China's near seas, at the East China Sea and the South China Sea, uh, it seems that there is a, a desire to, at the very least, have a zone of deference. Is there a relationship between the pers personal striving and national striving that you see? I think that there is, um, there's a couple of ways to look at it. One is that as the economy begins to slow down, mm -hmm. there is a reason for the leadership to want to establish a more direct, a more obvious connection between personal aspiration, personal satisfaction, personal self-worth, and national pride and national self-worth. Um, in a sense, the harder it gets, to satisfy yourself in an economic way, the, the greater need there is to give people another outlet for personal satisfaction and pride. Um, the problem is, is that you know, what the, if the goal is, um, if the Chinese dream officially is pulling together, establishing a more assertive role for China in the world, a more muscular position in the world, um, a safer, that's the way they would describe it, a safer position, a security environment that makes sense, something closer to what the Monroe Doctrine was to the United States at a point in our history. In order for China to achieve that, part of one of the implied requirements is that they will put aside disagreements on a domestic basis. And this is where you have, you have some echoes of what Hu Jintao was, was diagnosing, which is to say that in order to be able to move ahead as a country, we need to be more harmonious. Mm -hmm. It's not a coincidence that I think you've seen Xi Jinping re-embrace this Confucian concept, this sort of new Confucian idea. He recently went down to Chu Fu, and people probably saw this, and he, he said, uh, these books are books I need to be studying closely. And immediately they shot up on the bestseller list. I think uh, whoever the pub Confucius's publisher is is very pleased. Um, 
But what he's saying is, is that we need to pull together and set aside our internal disagreements. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the challenge, and um, this is sort of the fault line in this new concept of what's animating China at this point, is that what you're asking people to do is to say, I acknowledge that income inequality has now reached a point in which my own personal chances of satisfying my ambitions are much lower than they were before. Mm -hmm. Or I acknowledge that intergenerational mobility, the ability for my children, for instance, to surpass my generation, that those are much lower. Mm -hmm. If all of those are true, uh, it does make it harder for people to pull together and say, well, I'm willing to mortgage those ambitions, my personal ambitions, because I want to make sure that the South China Sea is secure. He's asking them to maybe do things a little bit differently, but he's also asking them to, the Chinese, she is asking the Chinese people uh, to believe things a little bit differently. You spend a lot of time on that in the book, which I think is, is very useful, and you write about the, the jur sort of mm -hmm. rule by virtue, that the idea that, that power is based on a moral foundation. And Xi Jinping has been banging that drum or gong pretty pretty hard. And, of yeah. course, anti-corruption campaign is, is part of this domestically. But at the same time, in terms of China's growing international influence, you have people like Yan Xuetong, who mm -hmm. gave a talk here a few weeks ago in Chinese, and others mm -hmm. who are also talking about a foreign policy and regional influence also based on the virtue of the governing of the governing party, the Tianxia or the Wang Dao yeah, the kingly systems, yeah. right? And do you see people buying into that? Do people think that the CCP governs by by virtue of its virtue now? And do they see that as a viable way of of, of projecting Chinese power and influence internationally? Are, are they? There seems to be an interest in Xi as as a strong man, as somebody who provides certainty. Um, but are are they buying this new catechism? I think they have a very, very long way to go to rebuild the party's reputation among people. I can tell you that living in China the last eight years, that was very noticeable, was the period in which in people's own lives the effects of corruption became so distinct that it was no longer an abstract sense that, you know, if only the emperor knew what was happening on the local level that he would solve this problem. You know, that has been the prevailing idea for a few thousand years. Um, there was a sense over the last few years, partly I think because of technology, people got the sense, well, it's not just that my local official is, is using power to his own advantage. It's, I can see on the web that it's somebody else over here is doing the same thing, and it's somebody else over here is doing the same thing. And I think that created, uh, it had a sort of compounding effect on the reputational damage to the party. And so Xi Jinping was absolutely right in getting into office and recognizing that he was facing an urgent crisis, um, which I think is interesting, because those of us who'd watched the corruption get worse over the last few years, there was a period where if you said that in the West to a China-watching community, people said, you're overstating the case. Right. Because I think that's partly because corruption is not as visible to Westerners as it is to Chinese participants in the system. Because it's, you know, China's not a country where you arrive and they shake you down at the airport the way they do at other places where I've lived. And um, like in Egypt, for instance. Um, and so it was easy to imagine that this was a, these were the growing pains of a, of a country uh, on its way, as the United States had a terrible corruption in, in its own point, and, and certainly Japan and Korea have also gone through similar experiences. Xi Jinping knew that was not the case. He recognized that this was a cancer eating at the, at the very basis of the party's support. I think at this point, people are not, frankly, I think it, it, we have to define who we're talking about, obviously. Are we talking about the political class or are we talking about the man on the street? The man on the street at this point, to the degree we can generalize, this is a, you know, this is a, vague, a vague way of doing it, but I would say that um, people are not imagining the, the value of uh, the reasons to project a, a kingly way, a Chinese virtuous um, policy um, around the region. I don't think that they see necessarily that there is a connection between cleaning up at home and uh, rallying support on the perimeter of Chinese power. Mm. Um, now, in the you know in the political class, are they saying that? I, I think you know the the part of the problem is, and this is to. You know, you've had more recent conversations with people about the possibility that that as a, as a, a motivating force is going to work as a way of rallying uh, 
friendship in the region. But I have to tell you, it seems it seems at this point like China is a long way from persuading, uh, from projecting to other countries that that is the way that it is going to establish new friendships, new alliances, new understanding in the region um, is by projecting its its virtuous political values. So what do we look for? You said that when the age of ambition becomes the age of disappointment or frustration, that that could be a key inflection point. Uh, but it can be very hard to discern when you've reached that because you hear so very many different voices. I was in China last week, and I was at the, the, the big Communist Party training institute they have now in Pudong, and mm -hmm. people were talking about corruption. And they said that corruption uh, is like one ball of rat feces in a well of otherwise pure water. <laughs> and the same night, I had dinner with an old friend who is a Shanghai hotshot lawyer, um, wealthier at 42 than everybody in my very large family combined will ever be, uh, <laughs> even several decades from now. And he used a, a, a similar metaphor, but he flipped it. He said that China was a barrel full of feces that had been gilded as with gold spray paint on the very top. And in fact, uh, he is, is getting his his people out and mm -hmm. describes them. He said, even though we're very wealthy, this new wave of emigration, we're really, if you, if you look at the, at the history of emigration, actually we're refugees. Mm -hmm. We're wealthy, but we said we're environmental refugees. And he meant both the poisoning of the land, air, and water, and he said as well as the Renji Guanxi, the right. personal relations. So you hear these very different views, yeah. and yeah. both have a body of evidence behind them. You know, we, we Sitting here in Washington, you read that the Chinese economy is about to collapse and that it, it's bouncing back. And every day there are signs which are purported to be, you know, key signs, manufacturing, yeah. whatever it is, both ways. And so it's, it's very tough yeah. to follow it. Is there anything in particular that you look for, that you're watching for economically, politically, to have a sense of which way things are going? Yeah, there is. Um, I should tell you one thing I also miss being back in Washington is that our, our, our political metaphors are not quite as vivid as they were in China. <laughs> um, I'm thinking of introducing them into an American context. Um, I'll tell you the thing. What I look for is the moment when, and I should say I look at this with trepidation. I don't look at this with any sense of anticipation. I don't think this is going to be an easy process. But I look for the moment when the people who have succeeded within the existing status quo decide that that subtle balance in their lives between a sense of possibility and a sense of insecurity has tilted in a direction that makes them want to take more active participation in their political lives. And I'll tell you exactly what I mean. I mean, there are people who, for instance, members of the new middle class who have had a lot of reason to remain what was described for so long as the red capitalists, you know, to be the people who were the beneficiaries, the stewards, the protectors of the system, both politically and economically. And I think what you've seen, certainly over the course of the time that I was living there, was that things like the environment, mm. which used to be regarded as, a, as, a, as, as the kind of thing that only Westerners were really paying attention to or cared about. Because after all, China was so poor so recently, so many people were so poor that they didn't have the luxury of imagining that, you know what, we can, we can let's not open this chemical plant. Let's actually just um, talk about what it is that we're going to do before we do that. That's changed. And now if you look at the way that middle class protests over particularly uh, the construction of chemical facilities, over water pollution, over the quality of the food supply. Um, these issues have become, they're, in a way, they're almost people have ambled into politics. Right. You know, they are not seeking to get up and become political people. In fact, many of the people who I have watched over the course of the last few years who have become more political, it's because they see what, you know, the single most important thing in their lives is a sense of security. And if you talk to Chinese friends, I bet a lot of people would find that they find something in common, which is that people have a feeling that they lack a sense of security, the anquengan, you know, this feeling of security, which is supposed to be so essential. Um, they don't have that right now. And that's one of the reasons why they send their money abroad, why they send their kids abroad, why they send themselves abroad. And ultimately, it's also why if they hear by text message that there is going to be a PX plant, a chemical facility built in their city, they're willing to take to the streets because it feels to them like 
It's not a political issue, it's a health issue, it's a safety issue. And so, and if you look historically at other countries that have reached a moment when political pressure becomes more pronounced, whether it's Hungary, for instance, or in a more, in a more immediate, uh, I think a more immediate comparison would be Taiwan, that when these, when these places have um, reached a certain level of income, and they have also started to create the possibility for political awareness of a certain kind. The environment is often one of the first issues that people motivate around, mobilize around. And I think you're starting to see some of that in China. So what I, what I, because, you know, you can see where that leads. So all of a sudden, you know, people who were willing for a long time to not participate in political issues of any kind because the costs and the stakes are very, very high. You, you, you know, there's a, um, a few years ago, when Charter 08, for instance, was released, and people will remember that was an online, uh, an online petition in favor of political reform, there were a lot of people who were not willing to do it. And I remember a Chinese writer said something along the lines of, people are not willing to risk their washing machines and their cars and their f travel uh, in order to sign some abstract political document. And I thought there was a lot of truth to that. But I think the difference is, it's no longer an abstract political document if you're talking about your children's health. Right. So I think that's the, uh, that's one of the key fault lines. I was struck, I mean, you speak of that fault line and people's attitudes changing. The, the book uh, is, it's narratives uh, following a number of people in Chinese society and you check back with them over the course of your years that you're there. And so we see their trajectories. It's not just their initial story, their trajectories. And it seemed to me toward the end of the book that almost everybody ends on a down note. Whether it's Weiwei or Han Han or Hu Shuli or Chen Guangcheng or even Tang Jie or this fellow Michael who wants to be an English teacher. You know, it's the story of ambitions rising, 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 different sorts of ambitions. But then almost everybody, in some ways even Justin Lin Fu, ends on a downbeat toward the end of that. Does that imply that you, you maybe see the age of ambition cresting in this next thing over the horizon? Or was that just the way that these individual stories happen to play out? Well, I think probably for the stage production, we'll have a big group number at the end. Of it. Very, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of jazz hands, very upbeat. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I didn't set out um, to end on that kind of note. And I have to be honest that it was, it was a reflection of the, the trajectory that the country has been on. And um, it, is, it is just a fact that each of these people who I have spent time with over the course of the last eight years has found themselves in a more complicated moment today than they were five or eight years ago. So for instance, even somebody who's not a political person at all, there's a guy who uh, I follow in the book whose name is Zhang Zhiming, who is a, uh, he goes by the English name Michael, and he's a young um, entrepreneur and English teacher. He had been a student of crazy English which you might remember was a very popular English teaching program in China. And um, he went out on his own to start his own English teaching program. And what he discovered was that it was very hard to do that if you didn't have connections. He's in a little town. You know, Michael, I should explain, grew up in a town called Coal Mine Number no. 5 uh, in Guangdong. His father spent 30 years underground mining coal. Michael got an education. He had opportunities that his parents never could have dreamed of. And yet over the course, and when I met him, he was working as a security guard on the edge of the crazy English camp. He couldn't really afford a ticket, but he could get a job there and he could learn by listening. And um, over the course of the next few years, this almost kind of sort of spectacular sense of optimism that he had when I met him um, dissipated. And by the time that I left, he was living in um, he had come to Beijing, and he was living in an apartment on the edge of Beijing in a room with seven other people in the room, seven other young men. And this is, in Chinese, people call these ant tribes because there's so many people living in these small spaces. And it's worth pointing out, these are not, you know, uh, migrant laborers of the kind that were the, the center of the story 15 years ago, no education, coming to get a job on an assembly line. These guys have some college education, vocational degrees. You know, they bought into the system. And now they're sitting on the edge of the capital, quite literally on the edge of the capital, trying to figure out a way to get in. And Michael said to me once, we were walking, he'd shown me his, he wanted to show me where he lived in Beijing. And then I think sort of seeing it 
with me, seeing it through my eyes. He looked at me looking at his life and it frustrated him. And we're walking out of there and we kind of step back out into the sunlight and he says, I got to get out of this situation. I got to get out of here. It's driving me down. It's holding me back. These people are no good for me. And, and then he said, what do you call me in English? What is the word for me? Mm. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, what is the term? And he said, do you, and his English is pretty good, but Michael was kind of working this out. And he said, what about low income society? Is that what you would call me? I said, no, I don't think we would call you low income society. We don't use that term. But I said, let me think about it a little bit. And I thought about it for a few more minutes. And I said, I think we would call you aspiring middle class. Mm. And he sort of liked that idea, <laughs> aspiring middle class. And, um, you know, I, I should say that, you know, the story on Michael and a lot of the other people I've followed is not finished yet. Right. And um, one thing I've learned over the years is that <laughs> oftentimes when I think I've reached the end of a, of a story on somebody's life in China, mm -hmm. there is often another chapter and another chapter. Yeah, I found, especially with Michael, a lot of the, the stories you tell are stories of, of famous people, but Mike, Michael isn't. I really wish there were photographs. <laughs> it was a great, really, very, very vivid portrait, and I, I, was, I wanted to know what he looked like, but maybe if you could email me a photo. <laughs> well, it's actually, if you're curious, we, we had this debate with, with the publisher, and initially we collected photographs, and then the publisher said, um, you know, I think you've, you've described them. Let's just let them stand on the basis of the words, not the photographs. And at the time, I thought, oh, what a great commendation of my literary qualities. And then I realized, you know what? I think they just want to save money, not publishing <laughs> photos. <laughs> it's the, uh, the last part of your book is on, is on faith, uh, fortune, truth, and faith. And you write a lot about growing interest in religion, uh, Christianity in particular, but also Buddhism and Taoism. And but you begin that section talking about how you moved right next to the Confucius Temple in, in Guozhijian, so you had that very, mm -hmm. you know, very special picture of, of Beijing and China. And I wanted to ask, because there have been various efforts in China to make guoxue, or to make aspects of Chinese history and philosophy, in essence, the national religion. And there, there are, I think, senses in which the real religion of China is China, mm -hmm. in that those are the faith propositions which are seen as justifying certain positions. Why do you think what you think? Well, mm -hmm. you know, this is what we Chinese think. I mean, that's, right. that's a religious faith. Mm -hmm. And often this notion of China as a religion or a quasi-religion, it can seem silly because it comes through the filter of the Communist Party propaganda. It can be very shallow. But actually in the tradition, there's a great deal of richness and a great mm -hmm. deal of moral guidance. Do you think that China, absent sort of the guoxia, abs absent the propaganda, if people were really free to delve into the tradition, is it living enough, is it real enough and accessible enough to actually provide the kinds of faith, moral guidance that you see people looking toward, or must they be looking for more highly elaborated religious traditions? Did you come away with a view on that at all? I think they've been cut off so much from history for all kinds of reasons, most immediately the Cultural Revolution, which was this incredibly destructive period in terms of Chinese philosophy, Chinese history, and Chinese religion, that they're dealing with, in a sense, they're standing amid the wreckage of their own philosophical history, and they're trying to figure out which pieces are still usable, which pieces are functional, which pieces make sense to them, what can be put together in a meaningful, relevant sense for today. Um, <clears throat> but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of confusion around what does it mean to be a Confucian? What does it mean to be a Taoist? I mean, I live next, as you said, I live next to the Confucian temple in Beijing. The Confucius Temple is, to people who have seen it, you know, it's a 14th century shrine in the middle of the city. It's a wonderful, wonderful place and had been very, very quiet for a long time. During the Cultural Revolution, it was used basically for storage of, of uh, artifacts that were considered problematic. And um, it was also the site of great violence during the Cultural Revolution. And uh, the writer, uh, Lao Xia, who was a great chronicler of Beijing was struggled against there. And uh, so in some sense, the Confucius temple itself is a reflection of all of these different competing currents when it comes to Chinese history. There are parts of Chinese history people do not want to talk about. And then there are parts of Chinese history that people desperately want to talk about. 
And then there is a version of Chinese history that is the official version of Chinese history. So all of these things are competing. What I would say is that when you go to the Confucius Temple, what you see is people, not young people. I mean, oftentimes these are people in the middle of their lives who are um, coming in touch with these traditions almost for the first time. And so I would watch people, I'd go to the Confucius Temple a lot. I loved it. I found it like, a, it was a very serene place. Um, and I would go and see people arriving for the first time and the tour guides were in their teens or their early 20s and the tour guides who worked there would take them around the Confucius temple and they would say here is how you pray to Confucius and they would teach them um, a physical gesture for instance about praying to Confucius and it was interesting to watch people in their 50s and 60s who had never encountered this before or not in the, particularly the way that they were being told to do it taught to do it and part of it was that some of these traditions are relearned some of them are also created in a modern sense um, and this is all happening in real time but there was something about watching somebody 20 years old teaching somebody 60 years old how to pray to Confucius that I thought captured this moment particularly well and um, I should say that there are some of these traditions are converging in a way um, you know these young people who are young nationalists who I spent a lot of time with in China have become very interested in the classics and the Confucian classics, um, they, they're reading about ancient sages. They're beginning to reenact some of these traditions. Um, they go to the Confucius temple now, actually, and they do some of these rites. Um, but it doesn't have a coherent framework to it. You get the feeling that it's happening. People are improvising. And it was not unusual for me living in China for people to go through, over the course of five or six years, to go through several different spiritual incarnations because they're trying things out. I mean, my friend, Lingu, who was a journalist, um, I lost touch with him for a little while. And I asked a friend, where's Lingu? And they said, oh, didn't you hear? Lingu became a hermit. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean he became a hermit? And they said, yeah, he's a hermit. He's living up in the mountains in Shandong. And I thought, well, no. How am I going to get in touch with a hermit? <laughs> it turns out hermits check their email now and then. So then this so actually I, sounds like a New Yorker cartoon with a guy on the mountain with his email. Yeah, exactly. Online, nobody knows you're a hermit. Um, <laughs> so I emailed Lingu, and I said, when you're coming to Beijing, let's get together. And he came to town, and... Um, you know, he had been, by his own description, a social butterfly. That was what he used to call himself. And he never used the stove in his apartment. He took pride in the fact that he had never turned it on because he was out every night. And, um, and then all of a sudden, he was up in the mountains. He had taken Buddhism into his life in a very emphatic way. And he shows up at the subway station. I meet him near my house. And he's wearing loose brown cotton robes, and his sh head is shaved. And uh, first thing he does when he pops out of the subway is he looks at me, looking at him, and he says, I'm a cliche, right? Middle class, my, middle class Chinese monk. And I said, no, you're not a cliche. You're just, you're, it's an incredible story. Let's sit down and talk about it. And uh, he's in the book. Uh, one last question, then we'll open it up uh, for the audience. I thought your love of the Chinese language is evident throughout the book. In fact, I, I was wishing that they had given you an appendix in which they let you put in the, the Hansa and the reference and the opinion for everything because there were a number of times when I said, well, what exactly <laughs> is that? What is the Lucian quote? Mm -hmm. uh, and publishers tend to think that it somehow is sufficient to just write the pinyin in there as though that would be helpful at all to people who didn't speak Chinese and it's not even always helpful to, to, to people who do. Um, now that you're back here, do you worry about losing your Chinese? How are you going to keep it up? I, I know that one of the reasons I keep going back and working on U.S. China stuff is I live in mortal terror of, mm. of, of losing what I've worked so hard to attain. And so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and about what role you see China more broadly playing in your life and in your writing uh, going forward. Uh, you, you, you've come back. Who knows when you'll get back again? Uh, what does this all sort of mean to you as, as, as a writer, as a speaker of a foreign language, now that you're back here in the States? What, what do you hope for that, for the, the continued presence of China and Chinese in your life. I've found, and you may have found this too, Robert, that you know, when you're back in the US now, that you are happy sometimes to have a chance to speak Chinese. And mm -hmm. um, 
So last night, my wife and I flew in. Uh, we'd been out of town for the weekend, and we came back, and we got into the airport, and we said, you know what? We've got a little time. Let's go over to Falls Church and get some Chinese food. So we went over to uh, a restaurant there, the Chengdu Xiaoguan, and, uh, called Hong Kong Palace for reasons that are mysterious to me. And uh, we go in, and, and we're so excited you know, to be there, and we're so pleased to be ordering in Chinese, you know, and I'm saying, we'll have the gambian suji do, and, you know, and the waiter is just like, all right, I've seen your type before, you know. <laughs> <laughs> He's answering in English, I'm speaking in Chinese, I said, all is right in the world. And um, I think uh, China's going to be a part of my life forever. I mean, it's a huge, huge part of the way I see myself as a person, and um, we're going to go back to China regularly, both of us, my wife and I. And uh, we were just there this spring. We'll be back again in the fall. I think I'll be writing about it. Uh, in the short term, I'll be writing about it less frequently for The New Yorker. I tend to write about it now online when we're writing. I'll write short things for NewYorker.com about China. But I'm, I'm a little... Um, wary of trying to write a full New Yorker piece, you know, the sort of five or 10,000 words, from here it seems like a real mistake. It's not, a, it's not the kind of work that has been at the heart of this right. kind of project. So um, we'll be back there probably to live. But for the next few years, I'm trying to reacquaint myself with this exotic foreign land, the United yeah. States. Well, thank you. With that, why don't we uh, open it up? We've got some past mics. Uh, so just if you have a question, please, uh, hands in the air. Why don't we start with Rose? Here's a, we've got a mic coming down for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed the lively exchange very much. Uh, in the earlier, uh, your talk, you talk about the uh, uh, disagreement. I, I believe it's in a political disagreement and try to reach a harmonious. Uh, uh, can you talk about the, the type of disagreement? Yeah, it's a great question. There are, um, there are dividing lines now between subcultures of many kinds. I think if we're, if we're creating a, an architecture of these political disagreements, you would have to put opportunity at the center of it. I think that's the most encompassing way to describe it, the people who have opportunity and the people who do not. And there are lots of different ways to get opportunity. You could be, you could just get there first. You know, there's the, the people who got tapped into the possibility of getting rich in China, um, and the ones who did it first. Those were those were a certain community of people. You know, the, I think we call them the Xian Fu Chunti. You know, and then then there are people for whom they say, well, there's just fewer opportunities to to get rich now. So that's one divide. Um, income is another divide. I separate those two because I do think that they do feel separate to people in China because you don't often hear people just simply describing their frustration with the rich. It's usually their frustration with the rich and corrupt or the rich and connected and so on. Um, there are divides. And then if we want to talk about politics, there are divides of very specific kinds. There's the, you know, there have been over the course of the last few years, there's the liberals versus the fenqing, you know, the angry youth, the people who see themselves as the protectors of China's image in the world. Um, but, you know, in a way, I sort of feel like I am, I'm generally reluctant, or I, I, I have a hard time endorsing fixed categories of disagreement because they move so often. And what I find most interesting actually is the individualized experience and to talk to somebody about what it is in their own specific circumstances that frustrates them about what they've been able to achieve or not achieve. So oftentimes it's less that, you know, it's, I come, I worked in the Middle East before I came to China. And I have to tell you that, um, this is back in the news now, but I used to work in Iraq and I worked in Egypt and so on. And over there, the divides were, were specific and ancient and unchanging in many ways. And, you know, um, even though the distinctions between Sunnis and Shias and Kurds had receded for a long time, they were there and they were, uh, and they were distinct. One of the things that's in a way that was refreshing about getting to China was that these kinds of divides were not the defining fact. 
and I should stipulate the obvious, which is that there are enormous ethnic tensions in China, and those will become a big part of our future. Um, but if we're talking about the, you know, the broad-based Chinese experience, then I think one of the things that's interesting is that these disagreements and divides are moving. Yeah. I've got Bob, and then right next to Bob, and then down front. Thank you. Well, congratulations, really, to both of you. This was a fascinating discussion. Um, Evan, I guess I'm moderately uh, reassured that you chose Veep as the <laughs> alternative to House of Cards rather than Game of Thrones. Uh, um, I, I want you to um, talk a little bit more about the second noun in your subtitle, Chasing Truth. Mm. Presumably most Chinese don't become hermits like your friend. Mm -hmm. um, who's chasing truth? How does this play itself out? Um, how do people define truths beyond ambition, aspiration? Um, how central is this really to the new China? Yeah, it's a great question. I think um, I'll tell you exactly what I mean when I talk about the pursuit of truth. You know, people began this process of opening up by the pursuit of fortune. You know, in the book I have three objects, the pursuit of fortune, the pursuit of truth, and the pursuit of faith. And pursuit of fortune is the most obvious to us. That's the one that is the chance to get rich after so long, uh, or at least not to get rich, to climb out of poverty. Um, and I often say, by the way, I point out, oftentimes we say that the, that the party has lifted people out of poverty. I always think that's the wrong verb. It has created the opportunity for people to lift themselves out of poverty. And I think that's an important distinction. It's one that I try to be mindful of. And I think after people began to do that, they began to accumulate this little nest egg for the first time in their lives. You know, they had the apartment or they got the car or they got the uh, little bit of money. Well, then they realized that is at risk if I don't understand who is setting the rules in society, who's breaking the rules. How is policy created? What are the relevant policies to my lives, uh, to my life? What are, how are companies run? Who is, if I invest a little bit of money, what's going to happen to that money? So it's actually, when I talk about truth as opposed to faith, faith are the existential questions. Faith is the, is the middle class monk, in a sense. Truth is, you know, when they first set up Chinese securities markets and they said, if we're going to try to have companies that are going to be listed in China, we're going to have to have some measure of sunlight on these places if we're ever going to have anything approaching an internationally respected financial system. And that's what created the opportunity for people like Hu Shu Li, the editor of Tai Jing Magazine and Tai Xin Magazine, that for, to have investigative reporting within the confines of the censorship system. But then also, on, a, on I think, on a much broader basis, you see people all over the country. This is what the enormous sort of energy behind the internet is all about, is that people for whom they never really thought that they were in the muckraking business, they realized, well, if I care about who is taking land in my town, well, all of a sudden I've become an investigative reporter, almost an accidental investigator. And that's what the internet has provided people the ability to do, with all the obvious caveats that it's restricted, it's constrained, it's balkanized, blah, blah, blah. It's also an entire realm of activity that simply didn't exist before. So um, I would say that the, the, the pursuit of truth is the pursuit of information that is relevant to the protection of your assets. Hi, Mr. Hosnels. Um, so uh, since you like metaphors so much, uh, <laughs> uh, so Deng Xiaoping, a uh, uh, former president of China, used to, ha used to use the uh, metaphor of cats. Mm -hmm. And I happen to have uh, one black cat and one uh, white cat. Mm -hmm. Um, and the white cat always steal food from the uh, black cat. <laughs> and nowadays they don't catch mouses anymore and they're uh, domesticated and eating mancha on me. <laughs> so I wonder, uh, what, what, uh, does China have a more problem with uh, tigers and flies or uh, more of a problem with cats? Hmm. Um, I think Probably. So the cats in your metaphor today in China would be ordinary people, or who would they be? Um, I, I would say the middle class. Yeah, I think so. I think it's a really interesting question, and I think 
one, I think our emphasis on the Tigers is misplaced. When we talk about the corruption campaign, we talk about the importance of taking down a few big names and that that will then project this chilling effect across the system. My own sense, talking to people, friends of mine, is that what actually matters to them most is whether the small minor acts of injustice in their lives are being corrected. And for that to happen, it means catching the, the flies as well. Um, you know, the, the guy who is standing between you and a business license, the guy who is standing between you and, uh, and success, you and your own ambitions. Um, I think when it comes to the middle class, the middle class is at this stage, there's still, and look, this is a vast generalization, but I think up to this moment, they still have more to lose than they have to gain by disrupting the political system and disrupting the political status quo. So I actually think that the, uh, it was the tigers and the flies who posed the most urgent threat to China's political stability in the years ahead. I, I really do believe that. Um, and if they can get them under control, then they have a better chance of persuading the cats to stay inside the system. Down front, please, and then back this way. Hello, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you very much. My name is Sahan, and I'm interning this summer here in Washington, D.C. I'm originally from Iowa. So my question is, uh, in the, uh, two years ago during the summer, I did I had the fortunate opportunity to go to Beijing for a vacation with my family. And the first thing when I went to Beijing, when I tried to get the Internet, internet they were like, well, uh, we're sorry. You have to find your own Internet card because some websites are censored in in China. So my question is, in your personal experience, when you lived in China, you know, a lot of Western media outlets were censored. So to find news in the United States or around the world itself, how did you deal with that censorship when you were living in China? It's gotten a lot worse, actually, over the course of the last few years. And just when I was there, and I'd be curious, Robert, if what your sense was, but, you know, when I was in Shanghai and Beijing just about six, six weeks ago, it was almost as bad as I've ever seen it. Um, and meaning that when you go online and you try to get on, even using a proxy, you know, a VPN, which is supposed to get you around these kinds of obstacles, even using those kinds of solutions, it was still very, very difficult. It was discouraging, which is the point. You know, in a po the, the point oftentimes is not to block you completely from getting to these places. It's just to raise the cost enough so that you'll say, well, maybe it's just easier for me to go to a, a site that's permissible. Um, so I, 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 you know, personally, I was, I, you know, your life slows down when you're on the Internet in China. And, you know, it's like the rings of the tree. They get broader and so on. And you just sort of sit there and wait for The New York Times to load. And, um, but I felt like it was absolutely vital to continue trying to get to these sites because otherwise you really would be, you'd be entering into a cloistered environment of information. But for your average Chinese user who's not willing to spend or can't spend that kind of money every month to pay their way around these obstacles, it's a, it's a very successful deterrent. Uh, to enlightenment, I'm afraid. I think that's a real problem because in the end, if I was itemizing the things that are going to be an obstacle to China's ability to create an innovation-led economy, for instance, or a create creativity-led economy, we got to put the internet uh, at the absolute top of the list because, I mean, the examples are are, are almost um, out of Orwell. You know, there's a, for instance, GitHub, which is a great and a very important platform for people who develop uh, software. It's like a, you know, the Facebook basically for developers. You know, they shut it down at one point because it was like a social media enterprise and that was suspicious. But all of a sudden that was saying to Chinese developers, all right, you're no longer going to get the, be the beneficiary of all of this information and knowledge out there in the world. So I think that's a real issue. Back, um, red and white. And then we'll go here and then back up front. Yes. Thank you. Um, I just finished teaching in China and uh, at the uh, university level, um, and I um, and I, I've taught Chinese students uh, getting their degrees in the United States. There's a lot of uh, now uh, exchange between um, uh, Chinese uh, university students and um, and the U.S. Um, it may be a drop in the bucket in the in the sort of larger scheme. I don't know how you would, how you would see um, that in that in those terms. But my experience is that the 
um, that the Chinese students see the West as very different, that the principles in the West are very different. They're taught uh, whatever U.S. principles are, and they can take what they, uh, what they uh, want in the long term. And I'm wondering what you think they, ta they do, in fact, take with them uh, over the long term. Um, uh, there is, a, I recently read something of uh, reflections on university um, faculty uh, having the same experience and saying, in fact, it's not long-lasting. Mm -hmm. That may also be a Western um, uh, a, a, a preoccupation of the West to, 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 to come our way, in a sense. So I'm wondering what you think of the, the effect of this exchange is over the long term. I think it has uh, two, two effects. Um, one, we should say that there's a reason why, in the short term, often it looks as if there is uh, no effect or a short short term influence, and that's because when you've been studying in the United States as a Chinese student, the experience of being abroad makes you more Chinese. It makes you more. Um, sometimes you become more patriotic. I would find myself in Beijing defending the sanctity of the U.S. Congress, and then I would say. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, something similar happens, I think. Um, then you go home, and you have to then defend yourself against your friends who say, ah, oh, you, look at you. You've become so Americanized. And there's, a, I think, a response to that in some sense. And let's also broaden this to say it's not just Americanized, but if you go to Australia or you go to Germany or whatever the effect would be. Um, but I actually think what you discover is that over the long term, there is an effect in the sense that people come to expect different things because it's hard to give up something once you've had it. And so, for instance, people won't come back and say all of a sudden, I'm a great advocate for democracy. But they will come back and find out, you know, all of a sudden if their neighbor seizes a piece of land next to the house that is supposed to belong to, let's say, the person, the returnee, all of a sudden that returnee is much more inclined to say, well, I'm going to take you to court. I'm going to take you to court and I'm going to expect a reasonable adjudication of the case. And if they find out that Chinese institutions are not up to their own personal standards, they may not attribute it to being uh, having spent time in the West, but I think they absolutely come away with a sense that there are ways for institutions, for structures to function that are worthy of their own experience, their own education, their own um, sophistication. And so oftentimes the language is not explicitly indebted to the experience abroad in any way. But people will talk about, for instance, justice. That doesn't feel like an overtly political term when you're talking about it, but it just feels like a personal term. Um, and then the other thing I think people come back with is a greater sense of, of, uh, of physical security, yeah, the environment, food safety. Um, it's not a coincidence that, you know, 10 years ago when I moved to China, nobody, very few people had traveled. And uh, I mean, if we're talking broadly. And so it was a lot harder for people to know that the air in Sydney looked a lot different than the air in Beijing. And it's, it's a lot easier to know that now. And people are just are, are, not, are not willing to give that up casually. And then we'll come down front. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you very much. I found it really fascinating. Um, I'm an environmental scientist, and I lived in China before about 10 years ago and also a couple years ago. So I'm very fascinated about your comment about these environmental refugees from the more wealthy class. And, um, and I keep tabs on kind of what's happening in environmental. I'm sure everybody else is. So I'm curious to hear from you what your sense of um, how China, the government, and how I think the common person is addressing this conflict, particularly in a sense of developing as a country, but also in its policies and um, financial growth. I think there's been an evolution over the course of the last few years. When I first moved to Beijing, I can tell you that the only people who would wear masks, for instance, when they went around Beijing were foreigners. Mm -hmm. Everybody, you know, looked like they were at home putting up drywall or something. Everybody was wearing these masks. And then actually, over the course of the last decade, it's really become much more Chinese. Friends of mine who are much more aware than uh, we are as foreigners, or at least much more willing to take steps to protect themselves. So it was Chinese friends, for instance, who were ordering masks from overseas or asking friends to bring them in. Um, and I think part of that is about the pursuit of truth, actually. Because what happened was that all of a sudden, what had been an abstract threat to their personal health became a very specific, uh, actually measurable threat when all of a sudden you could, you, know, you could look on your phone and you could find out, well, today the PM 2.5 is four times WHO standards. It became, um, it became a point of pride to be knowledgeable. 
And so actually it became, I've thought over the last couple of years that being aware of the physical threat posed by the environment has become a status symbol. And so friends will say, you know, ugh, the air is terrible today, because that indicates that you know enough to care. It indicates that you have the sophistication, the technology to pay attention. And so that's one thing. Um, I, I guess I would also say that, um, I'll, I'll probably just leave it there, actually. That makes more sense, yeah. Right down front here in the middle, please. Thank you both for a great conversation. Good to see you, Evan. Welcome yeah, back to the likewise. States. Thanks. Um, you both touched today on sort of where this inflection point will come uh, in China politically. Uh, you mentioned Charter 08 um, and the reluctance of the Chinese middle class in 2014 to cause trouble politically. But I'd like to ask about in recent years uh, that you've witnessed those who are willing to stir things up and the fate of those who um, choose to raise those questions and cause trouble, so, so to speak. Um, I'd like to ask about them in light of, they've been in the news a lot recently, uh, various activists and lawyers who have been detained in one way or another, these new rules and regulations that have just come out in the past week for Chinese journalists and Chinese lawyers. And I'd also like to ask, since we're here in the Wilson Center, about how this plays into the U.S.-China dynamic, because the, um, or the dialogue, because it certainly um, comes up often on the Chinese side. China's not ready for this, China's not ready for that. I wonder how you would chime in if you were to take, place in one of the, take yeah. part in one of those dialogues. I'm glad you asked about that, because it's, uh, I mean, it's funny. It's been a big part of my life. It's a big part of the book, is uh, the nature of dissent in China. And it's important. Um, it's not a sideshow, and it's sometimes I think we can sort of, it's easy to lump it and to make it into a sidebar conversation. Um, <clears throat> a number of the people who I've written about over the years began their experiences as participants in the system. And the person I'm thinking of most specifically is Su Zhiyong, and then also Pu Zhiqiang, both of whom are lawyers who believed, and I had this conversation explicitly with Pu Zhiqiang in 2000. Nine, he said, so for Pu Zhiqiang, for people who, uh, I think a lot of people will recognize his name, he's a lawyer in Beijing who has been uh, involved in a range of cases, some of which are politically sensitive, and over the years he's become sort of the lawyer of last resort. So when, when nobody else will represent you, then Pu Zhiqiang will often represent you. But, um, and for anybody who's interested in learning more about him, I, I recommend a film which you can find online, which is called Lao Ma Ti Hua, which is, uh, I'm not sure what the, the English title they use. Lao Ma Ti Hua is a particular kind of Chengdu soup. Uh, it's pig trotter in soup. And um, it was a film made by Ai Weiwei about his experience with Pu Zhiqiang in custody. In, it's English uh, subtitled? It's English know? subtitled. And it's worth seeing. It's a fascinating movie, and it's one I've never seen anybody make anything like it. What they did was basically carry a, a camera into a police station over the course of several hours when they were having this dialogue with police. It wasn't an interrogation. It was a dialogue. And it was almost like an exposition on the modern Chinese political problem of what are we, where, are, where are our responsibilities as citizens and what are our responsibilities as, as authorities. Anyway, Pu Zhiqiang said to me at the time, I have no interest in being an enemy of the state. And he meant that he was not seeking the kind of moral glamour that comes, and I don't mean that as a pejorative, I mean there was something legitimate about setting yourself at odds with institutions. He didn't choose to do that. He thought he was playing by the rules. And there was a certain point at which um, the rules changed or the interpretation of the rules changed, and all of a sudden, legal activity that he thought was permissible was no longer permissible, and I think that would apply to Su Zhiyong as well. Su Zhiyong had, after all, been a member of the Beijing, um, he'd been a delegate in the Beijing city government, in effect, uh, city legislature. So um, I think that the notable fact on dissent in China right now is that the, as the sphere of acceptable forms of dissent has narrowed, as that realm has narrowed, that there are people who are becoming, um, they're being made dissidents. Another example of that, I had a conversation with Ai Weiwei in Beijing in 99, which was 
you know, before he had become an activist. And he and I, I'd known him back from New York days. We'd worked mm -hmm. on something together. And I was asking him questions about his return and what he thought of China. And he said very sincerely, he said, you know, I'm really not very interested in China. <laughs> if I were a foreigner, I might be interested in China. But as a Chinese living here, he said, I'm just not interested in China. He got interested later for the reasons you yeah. describe, is that he, he discovered that he couldn't achieve things that seemed legitimate to try to achieve. Just Lao Ma Ti Hua, for those of you who want to look it up, it's L A O. Mm -hmm. M-A-T-I-H-U-A, -A, um, and it is English subtitle. Question uh, right, right here, Mike, then we'll go back to the Thank you, Evan. Uh, this is the third time, actually, I've been uh, <laughs> following your <laughs> book event. And I've uh, come Thank here early. I'm so happy to get, to get the chance to, to ask a question. Mm. And the other two, I didn't. Um, <laughs> so I know that um, uh, during my uh, the other two um, questions for you about those internet censorship or uh, difficult questions that you may have with those dissidents that the Chinese government uh, doesn't like. Uh, I did an interview a couple of years ago with uh, more than a dozen foreign journalists working in China mm -hmm. about their uh, work environment. So, um, and uh, to borrow the book title by Hillary Clinton, Hard Choices, mm -hmm. that I've been reading, and also I read your book, <laughs> what hard choices do you and other foreign journalists, for example, work in China if you want to write something like Qin Guangcheng, Ai Weiwei, and these people that the Chinese government doesn't like it? And I can quote any, uh, a small anecdote that Hillary wrote about uh, the Chinese ambassador here, Tri Tiankai, said, no, I don't want to be the alumni of Chen Guangcheng, mm -hmm. referring to his uh, normal university in Shanghai yeah. during the negotiation with, for Chen Guangcheng release. Yeah, Thank I you very much. I remember that story. Yeah, thanks for that question. I think, uh, actually, as a foreign journalist in China, um, it's, there's very little deterrent from writing about dissidents or writing about dissent. And I think that's partly because the Chinese government, frankly, expects that we will do that. They know that that's part of our job, and it's been a part of our job for a long time. Um, and I don't think that will change or should change. I think that's part of the job of a foreign correspondent is to give voice to people who don't have a voice in their own, in their own system. And that's not just true in China. It's also true in a lot of other countries. And, um, and I think that's worth pointing out. Oftentimes it can feel to the Chinese government, well, why are you picking on us the way you're picking on us? And oftentimes the truth is that we, we, it's, it's in our DNA to be adversarial to government. That is the nature of journalism. And um, that's actually a very good line in China because Xi Jinping is big on talking about what's in the DNA of the Chinese people. Yeah. And they're picking up on that discourse. It's a good way to put it. And I, so uh, and then just one other thought is that, um, you know, I think so it's actually not that hard to decide to do that. Um, what's harder now for people and it's not a much a choice, but it's about bearing the consequences. And that's writing about uh, the acquisition of wealth by, uh, obviously, by members of the leadership. That's become very sensitive. Question right, right in the middle. Right here. And then back to the corner. Hi, Marvin Hoff, Executive Director Emeritus of the Foundation for Theological Education in Southeast Asia. Beginning in 1982, a better description of, of our foundation would be in China. We supported all the ECC seminaries that were open across the, the country. In May, I think I have this right, in May of 2006, Bishop Aloysius Jin in Shanghai led the consecration of his associate to be adjunct bishop and uh, be the, become the bishop when Jin died. I have heard but have not been able to verify that the next day he disappeared and has not been seen since. Do you know anything about the Catholic situation in Shanghai? I'm afraid I don't. I can lead you to, if you want to talk afterwards, I can also direct you to people who could tell you more. Uh, but it's a good subject. Yeah. Sorry, all the way back in the corner, please. I'm looking forward to reading your book. Thank you. <laughs> and earlier you mentioned uh, some young generations 
uh, become a, a nationalist. Can you explain why? What are the reasons? And also, I have a question about you. You mentioned that the middle class right now are very worried about uh, safety and the security issue. How about you? Do you wear a mask? Do you, uh, you have already been living in China, in Beijing for years, and uh, you're going to live there. Are you worried about your health, your wife's health? Thank you very much. Thanks for the question. I, would, I guess I should describe myself as aspiring middle class, uh, like Michael. Um, I think, uh, personally, no, I didn't wear a mask. Um, and uh, it was not particularly well thought out. I just decided it was a little bit, it was odd enough being a foreigner in China. I didn't want to add an additional barrier between myself and the people I was interacting with. Um, though I then found by the end, actually, that uh, among a certain stripe of Chinese society, I looked really out of touch because I wasn't paying attention to the health of the air, my, my own pulmonary health. Um, the answer to why people become nationalistic as young people in China, I think, is related partly to the period in which they've come of age. You know, they, uh, people I'm talking about generally have been born after the advent of economic reform after the end of the Cultural Revolution. So they have come of age at a time in which China's economic growth was the dominant fact of their lives. They were growing up at peace for the first time in a long time. Um, oftentimes their parents had grown up in mid enormous turmoil and were not very interested in talking about it. And the history books were not very interested in dwelling on it. And so what they saw was a country that was bigger stronger, more developed every year. And I think that fortified their pride in the country. That's, the, that's one of the things. And you know, the, the young man who I write about a lot in this book named Tang Jie, I mean, he says to me, I remember when the first highway came to my town. And I remember when the first internet cafe came to my town. And so for him, the landmarks of Chinese experience are not war and upheaval. They are, in fact, physical development. But I think then the other piece of this, which is worthy of an entire additional discussion, would be patriotic education. And there has been a very systematic effort to reinforce in the education system a belief that, um, that China is strongest when it is um, rebuffing attempts from abroad to prevent its rise. And that is a very concrete um, and explicit message in the education system that's been developed since about 1992. Well, we take two final and very quick questions, if we could, uh, to wrap up. How about uh, Doug, and then you, if you wouldn't. I'm sorry to the people that, that uh, we didn't get to. Well, let's take both questions, one, two, and then let, let, let Evan take them both at once. Let me add to what others have said. This is a fascinating discussion. Um, you mentioned the difficulties, uh, increasing difficulties, of using the internet and the way that uh, things are more suppressed now. Some have suggested that one reason the government is doing this is because of the large uh, reform agenda which they have and that they need to ensure that uh, um, things are under control. Uh, this would suggest that maybe if they succeed in some of these reforms, they might then loosen a bit. Do you think this explanation has any validity or any value? Um, and if not, what is the reason behind the, uh, the, the tightening in, the, in recent uh, years of the internet? And then one of the, let's take both questions. Sure. Uh, okay. I don't know how it works. Beverly mm -hmm. Hong Fincher. Um, mm -hmm. Hi. Um, I've been following your <laughs> <laughs> your book as well. Uh, anyway, I just like to correct one thing about the wearing masks. Mm -hmm. In the 80s, and I've been going to China off and on from the 70s already, but in the 80s, if you looked at the pictures of television shots, you would have noticed a lot of people, Chinese, mm -hmm. wearing masks, mm -hmm. you know, riding their bikes in the earlier days, riding, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. wearing masks. So it's not it's not a trendy thing mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> from Western. Speaking of Western influences, the, I, I noticed that last year, last summer, in the Boston area, in Cambridge, Boston area, uh, there was a group of Chinese students still studying in this country. They held a conference called Civil Societies, but they did not 
dare to use that word. Mm -hmm. They use some other term to discuss it. So there is ample of evidence that the, the visiting students or the students who are still here or, I don't know, uh, intending to return to China, they intend to do something. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great point, and I, I, would, I would confirm that. I think that the impact of being abroad has a deep effect on people, sometimes in a way that they don't explicitly acknowledge as being, uh, uh, as being um, transformative. But I'll just very briefly, one example that I think is worth mentioning is that there's a guy in China, some people will recognize his name, named Fang Zhouzi, who is a uh, self-appointed uh, guardian against academic and scientific fraud. He's, an, he's a fairly eccentric character. I write about him in the book in the context of his feud with uh, Han Han. Some people will rec remember that. Fang Zhouzi, though, I think what's worth pointing out is that Fang Zhouzi was a graduate student in the United States. He was a science PhD, and, and he began the process of, of this, he built this community online in the early days of the internet. And um, he brought that he generated a following in the United States. He started sniffing out academic fraud. He brought that back to China. It's become a, a phenomenon in his, he's now a very influential person, finding examples of, for instance, um, plagiarism in, in academic journals and so on. He's also fairly nationalistic in the sense that he sees himself as opposing some figures who are more liberal in their orientation. And he would never acknowledge, I think, that the experience of being abroad had that impact on him, but there's no question in my mind, and if he was here we would have a great conversation about that, and I've talked to him about it, that the experience of being abroad awakened his sense of possibility to scientific inquiry and, and you know, contesting ideas in a way that was impossible in China at the time. Um, and then uh, in answer to the question about why Xi Jinping is moving in the direction he is at the same time that he's opening up or seeking to make economic reforms, you know, the people here may recall Deng Xiaoping's line that he used to say that when he was turning right, he would turn on his left hand turn signal. And that's partly because if you're about to do something that's going to raise suspicions about your political credibility, well, then you need to demonstrate that you are redder than red. Mm. Uh, I'm not convinced, actually, that that's what we're seeing. And I think um, um, what I would say is that, you know, there is an argument that in order to take, undertake major economic reforms, that he needs to clamp down politically in order to do so. But I think one of the things that is worth examining, it could be a conference unto itself, would be what is the linkage? Let's draw that linkage out more explicitly. And let's say, well, why is it exactly? Because if, he's, if he needs to undertake financial reform, for instance, if he needs to challenge vested interests in the state-owned enterprises and in the finance industry, I'm not convinced that that means that you need to prevent citizen corruption fighting from doing their work because I think the danger is is that by clamping down on that he is closing off what had been existing channels for dissent and that that creates pressure and ultimately what he's trying to prevent is an abrupt explosive change in political culture of any kind but I think that in effect by being by constraining what had been existing channels that it's actually raising the likelihood of a more abrupt change I'd like to thank everybody for coming this morning. I'm sorry that we didn't get uh, to get to all of your questions, but I think you may find some of them answered uh, in the book. And I'd like to thank Evan Osnos of The New Yorker. Thanks, Rob. And wish you best of luck in your writing, and we hope to see you here at the Wilson Center again. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Oh, thanks. That thank was great. Thank thank you. Oh, with great pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. I really enjoyed that.